gonna praise when the sun is rising. I'm gonna praise when the sun goes down. Time and again, the evidence surrounds me. You are good, you are faithful in my life. I won't lean on my own understanding.
up in your presence I just wanna sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never wanna leave Oh, I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where I started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to see. Anything 
Father, we come before you and we just ask you that you would join us in this space today. God, as we open up your word and as we continue this Jeopardy series, as we examine what it means to be in jeopardy, to be in turmoil, and how your word and the truth of your word contrasts with that, God. Would you speak to us through your word? Speak to us through Pastor Mike. God, may we be encouraged, uplifted, and enlightened as we leave here today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, deals with uh, high school track and Andrew can relate to this as he's a, a, a track coach. But uh, high school track meets feature athletes running a variety of distances around a 400 meter oval, which used to be uh, 400 yards when I was in school. But everything's went to meters now, so 400 meter oval. The, uh, the 3,200 meter run is the longest race that uh, they have in track, which is two miles, of course, if you, add, if you do the math. Runners race eight laps around the track. The race starts at the beginning of turn one. The 100 meter curve is followed by a 100 meter straightaway another 100 meter curve, and finally a 100 meter home stretch. The 3200 has 16 long left hand turns and 16 straightaways between the start and finish of the race. No matter where the race is run, the track is the same. Each race finishes where it begins. The, begin the beginning of the race is important but not as critical as the end. Prizes aren't awarded until the end. Trophies are reserved for the finishers, although spectators and teammates often cheer, cheer and shout, cheer and shout encouragement. The runner's relationship with the start-finish line is what matters the most. The runners step over the start-finish line nine times during the race in all, but the final crossing, the line delivers the same message, keep going, finish. Every time a runner crosses the line, the longing to finish grows stronger. As Christians, we too have a finish line upon which we focus. We may not realize, however, that every time we gather around this table should serve as a reminder that our race is continuing. The time of this table is like crossing the line that completes each lap. The Apostle Paul encouraged the believers in Corinth, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If the loaf and the cup of communion could talk, they might offer this message. Keep going. The end of the race is drawing near. The longing to finish grows stronger. Every time we eat the bread, every time we drink, 
it builds up our hope. Every time we gather, we realize that Jesus' promises are near. Nearer now than when we first believed. Keep going until the end. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for everything and all the blessings that you continue to give us each and every day of our lives. And Father, we know that we're running that race and we're looking forward to that finish line. We're looking forward to the time when you have promised you will come back. And we know that promise will come true. You come back to take us home. So as we partake of this loaf and this cup this day, let it be a true reminder that we're still in the race and the finish line is near. So, Father, I thank you and praise you for your son who gave his life up for us. I pray this in his name. Amen. Well, we've got our, some of our young people, our teens are out at to Chino with the Trails today, along with some of our staff. So we are church members. We hope that they're having a good time. We had some kids that were out there yesterday. And did you all have a good time yesterday? Yeah. Any kids were out there? Yeah? Okay. Well, we're going to let you head on back with uh, Mary. We'll meet you back there today. I guess the teens will stay in here with me today. Uh, just a reminder here to check out the bulletin information that we have and the other announcements of things that are coming up here. Uh, we have the, try to keep everybody updated that way. And if you missed the announcement last week uh, and we're not here, we brought Seth on to help us with our music and media outreach. And we're thankful for him and the work that he's doing. And so uh, we'll see him each week working with their team and, and help us in the background in a lot of different ways. So we appreciate that. And thank you, Jack, for your meditation. Always helpful when we have that encouragement that we receive from those who share in that particular way. Well, today we are going to continue our series on This is Jeopardy. And again, just for context, let's understand that most people in this world don't realize the jeopardy in which they live or exist. It'd be like those people who the day before a tornado or a hurricane came in and destroyed their home. They're not sitting there thinking about what the aftermath might look like. They're not thinking about the damage that might come. Uh, they are hoping against hope that nothing like that ever happens. The wonderful thing about scripture though the most helpful thing about scripture is it shows us the before picture, 
the here's the picture now, the present picture, and then what the picture can look like afterwards. And then God gives us a chance to choose. He knows what we were like before. If we will admit that, if we'll confess that, then He can change the way things are for us in the moment. And then He can change the consequences. We get to choose the difference of where we're going to be. And that's why the graphic nature of, you know, are you going, are you heading to heaven and eternity, the streets of gold and all that? Or are your, is your life path towards uh, hell, the punishment of eternal fire? And so it's in the present that we get to change and deal with this idea that we live in this jeopardy, so to speak. The very reason Jesus came and the reason that he's described in so many different ways, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think I mentioned last week, there's at least 50 50 different ways that Jesus is described. Those descriptions help us understand how he helps us in our jeopardy. And if we don't understand that the life that we're living in right now is jeopardy, that means that there's harm and risk of us losing things, of, of death, of uh, destruction in our lives. And it not just happens in the present, but it also happens in the ultimate fashion in the future. And Jesus comes along and he says, I want to help you with this issue of jeopardy. And he says, I'm going to help you by being these following things. We've talked about a number of different things. Last week we talked about how he's the light of the world. And he helps us see through the sexualism of our culture. And today we're going to talk about he is the bread of life. And he wants to help us fed with the right kind of nourishment in this world, in this life right now, so that we can, we can uh, find forgiveness and redemption from our past and hope and healing uh, for a future in heaven and on this earth. I love that Jesus described himself as the bread of life. We were at Texas Roadhouse the other day. You guys know what I'm going to say. You've been to Texas Roadhouse and they bring that big old basket of uh, yeast rolls. And if there's two of you, they bring four. And if there's eight of you, they bring eight. And so you want to go, what you want to do, What our, we had some people that, were, that came in right after us. And the minute she sat down, she says, we'll want extra rolls and extra honey butter or cinnamon butter, whatever it is that they make there. But we were able to go to Texas Roadhouse um, because someone here from the church gave us a gift card, probably for Christmas or some other time. And we kind of hold those things until um, we have the opportunity to use them. And we were running a little later uh, in Richmond the other day, so Texas Roadhouse was open. So we went in. I ate that first piece of hot, fresh yeast roll. And, Put some of that butter on it. Oh, goodness gracious. And of course, Elizabeth's got a gluten issue, so she can't eat any of those. And so I eat her share as well. Wow. It's a sacrifice, I know, but that's just kind of the guy I am. And then we asked for some extra to bring home to the kids. I don't know if the kids got to eat any, but uh, I think, Andrew, did you enjoy some of those Texas Roadhouse rolls? They're just so good. They're so delicious. Let's play a Jeopardy game here about bread. You know, we go to these restaurants and they love to give us uh, some kind of free bread appetizer. I'm not sure because then they bring us oversized dishes. I mean, I could understand if you were one of those frou-frou restaurants where the plates, you know, you go in and the small plates and it's got a string, one string bean and one little... You know, one ounce of steak or whatever. I can understand if they filled you up on bread there, but at Texas Roast House, they bring on these big plates with steak and french fries and baked potatoes, whatever. But you go to these different places, and here's a let's play our own game of Jeopardy this morning, okay? So you got to buzz in, doo -doo -doo -doo, okay? And I'll, I'll be able to see who came in first. <laughs> um, here it is. Here's the first clue. You ready? Red Lobster offers these cheesy forms of bread. Anybody? Oh, Cheddar Bay Biscuits. So you do know. You got it. Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Now, someone might say that that's not bread. It's a biscuit. Is biscuit a bread? 
Okay, so there you go. It tastes like bread. Here's another one. Maybe you know this one. Olive Garden loves to tempt you with this basket of delights as you prepare to order. Uh, incorrect. Where this is Jeopardy. What is breadsticks? There you go. That is what is garlic breadsticks. There you go. We're playing Jeopardy. It's got, it's got to be in the form of a question. And it's always, what is breadsticks, Alex? Okay. How about this one? Outback Steakhouse offers this bread in this color and shape. I'm sorry. We're playing Jeopardy. I don't. I, what is honey wheat bread? Okay, I didn't ask what kind. I said what color. What is brown loaves of bread? Okay, that's close enough. Well, we'll give you that. Brown loaves of bread. That's the ground. All right. So anyway, you go to these different places and you get the bread and they, you put butter on it or at the lobster you get the Cheddar Bay biscuits and you hope that they're fresh out of the oven because they got a little crunch there on the bottom and you bite into them and they kind of have steamy quality and they're just so good, you know, that kind of thing. Huh? No. However, everybody's been saying that it smells like biscuits and gravy in here today. And I, I don't know if Alan was up here fixing that stuff yesterday or not. But Well, the interesting thing is this is not new. In ancient Rome, uh, during the days when Jesus was here on this earth, a similar game could have been played because various forms of bread could be found in the shops and the eating places that you might find there. In the first century, bread was actually a sign of health and prosperity for the nation. So it makes perfect sense for Jesus to claim, and it means something significant, I am the bread of life. That description, I am the bread of life, might not have the same significance for us because we think of it as a kind of dinner treat to go along with the main meal, but in that particular day and time, bread, just like grains used to be at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, you remember the health pyramid? At the bottom was grain, so you're supposed to have as much grain, you know, as many grains as you wanted during the day. They've changed that a little bit. But bread, as the saying goes, is life. When we think about what Jesus meant and what it means to us, when he says, I am the bread of life, it really deals with this issue of jeopardy in which we find ourselves. And today we're going to discuss that jeopardy in the form of compromised behavior that is uh, seen in sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Now these are phrases that come from Galatians as we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we set this whole thing up. They are non-spiritual, natural acts of the flesh, Scripture says. These are the things that we do when we're not thinking about the spiritual. These are things that we do when we don't think about the consequences emotionally. These are the things that we do because we may have emotional needs, so we're doing something physically to try to address it. There in Galatians chapter 5 where it describes these acts of the flesh. Let's look at verse 16 through 23. Paul writes these words to the people of Galatia. He says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, and there are uh, others we won't go into today. And he continues, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. We can spend all day unpacking this verse, but really it is just the illustration for us of how the acts of the flesh that we're going to talk about today, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, we overcome them, and the damage that they do to us, which it leads to destruction in our life, we do not inherit the kingdom of God if we are driven by these different things, these kinds of things. However, if we're led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ lives in us, we're letting Him feed us, we're letting Him meet our needs, he is the bread of life. Then we have the hope of eternity and the kingdom of heaven. And instead of choosing these things in a carnal way, just in a fleshly way, we are spiritually discerning how to meet our needs. And that brings to us love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, these are a description of what happens to us when we consume Jesus as the bread of life and we discern things spiritually in our life and we listen to him and he teaches us how to address things, the needs that we have. And when we do that, he as the bread of life fills us up and we're made strong. Now these are just three of the 15 acts of flesh that we sometimes substitute for the bread of life. And that's the most important part here is when we when we go after these things like sexual immorality, impurity, and abauntry in our life, it's because we are trying to substitute them for something that is missing, or we think is missing in our life spiritually. What is missing is we're choosing not to partake of Jesus as the bread of life. And when we substitute these things for the bread of life, they disqualify us from enjoying Jesus' sustenance and superiority in our life. The ability to live in a superior way. So those are the things I want to talk to you here today. So here's the jeopardy. This is jeopardy. Our current environment, as we discussed last Sunday, described to uh, which we described in our YouTube channel, or which you can see if you missed it. Subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, and you can get this. Um, and just go to YouTube and type in Palestine Church of Christ. You'll see that you can join and subscribe to that channel. And you'll see a, you know, a logo that you'll notice. Last week we defined sexualism and described it as something that is defined and debate that defines, excuse me, let me say this again. Our current environment that we talked about last Sunday is one defined and debased by sexualism. Now sexualism, as we talked about last one, is when we make everything about uh, sexual, the sexual nature of our life. And we're driven by that. Jesus changes that in our life so that we're looking at everything spiritually. And how can we restore the educated patterns that he has provided for us that we find in scripture so that we can overrule the compromised behavior of sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, and all the others we'll talk about in the other cycles. We've got two other cycles of this. We'll talk about the other, we'll talk about some more in three weeks and another in six weeks or so. We can only accomplish overruling our compromised behavior by eating Jesus as the bread of life. Now, some people think that that sounds gross. But what Jesus was talking about here is metaphorical. You know he's talking about consuming him. And even when we partake of the communion, it is representative of us eating of his bread and drinking his blood. For a while, for a while there in the first, second century, uh, non-believers thought Christians were cannibals because of this ritual. But what it does for us is it's something we have to take very seriously and we have to consider and think through and we can only accomplish this by eating the flesh of Jesus, drinking his blood metaphorically through the act of communion and through our meditation and communion. And it leads us to this clue in Jeopardy today. What sustaining and superior thing did Jesus claim he is that if we consume, 
We will never go hungry and never be thirsty. And will give not just life to us, but eternal life. So that we no longer seek to gratify our flesh through sexual immorality, impurity, or debauchery. Do, 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 do. Pastor Mike, uh, who is the bread of life? That is correct, Pastor Mike. And if you say the very same thing, who is the bread of life, if he is the answer to that clue, or he is the question answer to that clue, then not only do you win life, but you have the promise of life, both now and forevermore. Because Jesus is the bread of life that sustains and is superior. He doesn't just give us the promise of eternal life where everything's going to be great for us in the future. He says to us, if we change the way that we consume the things that we see and hear and, and, and participate in this world, and we let him govern them, we let him overrule, we let him guide us, so to speak, in what is good, what is not, then we will change the condition of our present life to something that is uh, livable, it's hopeful, it has that eternal quality, and then we have the, the promise that whatever we don't get addressed here, we don't, are not able to overcome here because we're dealing with failed people all around us, that in eternity it will all be made new. So the jeopardy we live in is this problem that we have in culture that is expressed in sexualism in a big sense that is lived out in sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, as we'll talk about today. So let's talk about how Jesus as the bread of life is so sustaining. Jesus as the bread of life is so sustaining, we will never go hungry and we will never be thirsty. But if you try to consume the uh, things uh, like sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery that the world offers to you, it will leave you uh, completely hungry and thirsty all the time. Perfect example of that might be those with addictions of any kind. You'd think, oh man, if I just get a taste of it, I'll be fine. It'll last for how long? And then you have to get another taste, something more intense. Jesus makes an incredible claim. And if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 6, because this is kind of the meat of what we're talking about here today. But he makes an incredible claim in John chapter 6 about being the bread of life. Now, the day before, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves, and, uh, five loaves of bread and two small fish. And not only did he feed all those people, but they took up baskets and baskets of leftovers. Later on, after his disciples went across on the sea, Jesus crossed the sea on, by walking on the water. And by doing these things, and the people recognized something was going on here, must have done something incredible. He was demonstrating in this particular context that he was the prophet um, that had come into the world, the Messiah, so to speak, the Savior. And trust me, these people were desperate enough. They were looking for someone who would come along and say, Listen, I am your Savior. I'm your Messiah. Because they thought of it in a different way. They thought of it in a very physical, more uh, national way where an army would be raised up and then Jesus would be their king. And they even tried to make him king because he had these unique powers. And Jesus rejected that. And that brings us to John here where we pick up the story in John chapter 6, verse 27. It says, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they ask him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they ask him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in, will, in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives light, or life, excuse me, to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If you've ever been to 
one of these places where they bring out the baskets of bread or breadsticks or cheddar bay biscuits, you know. They'll come along and, have you ever been, well, there's one left and they're coming back. You kind of see them and you're thinking, I need to take this and either hide it on my plate or, you know, put it on my plate. And they'll come back and they'll see the baskets empty and they'll say, what? Would you like another? Yeah, well, sure, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because you think I can take those home if I don't finish them up uh, later. So we, we're not, I, I'm sure not, you're not the kind that, you know, take a napkin, fold them up and put them in your purse or your pockets or anything like None of you do that, right, to, to kind of forward that. But here are the people that Jesus was talking to. They were like, uh, okay, here, this guy you fed us yesterday. What's, what's, for, what's for breakfast today or for what's for dinner today? You know, give us this bread. And they try to chide him. They challenge him. Well, Moses, our forefather, he gave us bread from heaven. Of course, Jesus Christ him said, no, it wasn't Moses who gave you that bread. It was God who gave you that bread. And then he, he could have illustrated later on that there were other parts of that story that the people didn't understand, did not get. But they were just looking for another free meal out of this. And Jesus was offering to them something even more incredible. He said, the bread that I give to you that comes down from heaven, it gives life to the world. And whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So Jesus is saying, I am. I am that bread. Now, we know he's not talking about physically. We know he's not saying, I am bread. You can, you know, take a, you know, take a bow out of my arm or anything like that. He's saying, I am the sustenance of life. I am what you are searching for, but you want another free meal. I'm trying to teach you a free lesson here about life. And that is that I'm going to give you the bread that is really uh, eternal, that gives us eternal life. And you'll never be hungry and you'll never be thirsty. And other again, you'll never want uh, in the same way again. Now this is a this is very not nuanced, so try to hear me. Christians who believe in Jesus and who trust that He is going to meet their every need, hit their every need, should never want in the same way again, because you know that God has a way to meet every need you actually have. Now the world, the devil, he does the opposite. He wants you to think about what your wants are, not your needs. And he's always tempting you, trying to lead you away with things of this world that do not satisfy, do not fill. And says, this is really what you want, but it never satisfies. And Jesus says, this is what you need, and it always does, because it is true sustenance. In 2018, of December of December 2018, Jeopardy had a category in which, or a clue on the show, in which they asked this question. So Jeopardy finally solved this with the clue, a dog command, it's always the anatomical name for the end of bread. Anyone? What is a heel? Thank you, April, for forming a formal question is a question. What is a hill? Now, what was funny is after that show uh, appeared, there were just the talk shows all over the country picked up on this. What do you call the end of bread? And so they had this contest and people, some people call it the butt. Some people call it the end. Uh, we've always called it the hill. Some people, you know, there are other names like hub and then there are other names from that came around the world, but Jeopardy has solved it for us. The name of the end of bread that we cut off is, what is it, April, again? What is a heel? That is correct. What is a heel? Now, whatever you call the ends of bread, which uh, if it's something we're cutting, not necessarily loaves of bread we buy from the store, they're a little different. But if we... If we cook up some French bread or some, uh, some sourdough bread in the oven, my pieces are always the two end pieces. I just love them. They're my favorite. So whatever you call your favorite part of the bread, that's really what Jesus is. Plus, he's the rest of the bread too because he's going to continue to feed us as we live in this world. Not just physically, but he promises emotionally and spiritually Compromised behavior for 1,000, Alex, might be 
a category we'd be dealing with today because most of the people you know and love have no clue that Jesus is the bread of life. They have no clue that he is the one who sustains us by his very word. And that those who come to him and believe in him are the ones who are satisfied and sustained so that they don't need to compromise their behavior pursuing sexual immorality and impurity. Now there's a battle that goes on in our bodies. And Jesus says, let me address this from a spiritual point of view. I can meet every one of your needs as the bread of life. And the devil on there says, no, he doesn't, because he, he doesn't want you to have any fun. So here's some fun stuff you can do that will meet your needs. No, it just addresses a carnal want. What Jesus is trying to do is save us from that carnality by giving us what we really need. Just like a parent would try to save a child from itself who wants to eat um, cake every morning. And so the parent says, no, we need some eggs. You need something else. You need something, something nutritious kind of thing. We can educate the people that we know and love who are around us to follow the pattern of Jesus. Because we won't be fooled into thinking that fornication and indecency can sustain us. And this word sexual immorality and purity... They come from the Greek word pornaya for sexual immorality is the word we get fornication from. It just means any kind of sexual activity outside of the disciplined confines of marriage. And indecency is that kind of anything that is just impure and appropriate in our approach to things. And it can take on a lot of different you know, variations, but in the context here of sexualism, Indecency is just about anything you see on primetime TV or the freeform channel now that used to be the Disney channel. There are these patterns that the world wants us to fall into. Just say, oh, just be like us. You know? We've got all this kind of thing, all these things going on. You see it on TV. You see there's no big consequence. No, nothing bad happens unless it's on a soap opera. Then everything bad happens from... Those types of things. The world says, it's, let's normalize it. It's no big deal. And Jesus says that I am the bread of life. Those who partake of those other things, they will die. But if you partake of me, my words, then you will live. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. I think Paul kind of clearly lays that out. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Um, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So... Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he includes sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. He says all of these are idolatry, self-worship. Set your mind on things above. Set your heart there where Christ is. Set it on him, not on earthly things, because we've died to that when we came to Christ and our lives now hidden with Christ in God. You know what that means? We use the word hidden, but what that really means is we're wrapped up in him. He's protecting us. And Jesus loves us so much that he wants to wrap us up and protect us from all the violence and insanity that goes on around us in this world. And most people, they, they look at Jesus and say, well, you're my enemy because you want to keep me from having fun. That's not it at all. He wants to be your savior to keep you from destroying yourself. He is the thing that helps us overrule this compromised behavior that we have in life. He actually wants to help us govern our flesh, is the idea. When he governs our flesh, he helps us look at it not from purely violent and vile point of view, but from a righteous and um, sane, a community point of view. What is best for not just me, but for everybody around me. 
He helps us overrule our compromised behavior by helping us govern our flesh, by teaching us that we, he is the bread of life. Whatever it is we need can be met in him and through his way of providing for us. The bread of life, it sustains, but the bread of life is also superior. The bread of life is so superior that we will live in, we will live now and also live forever if we partake of Jesus as the bread of life. If we choose not to partake of Jesus as the bread of life, we're left with whatever scraps the devil can fool us into consuming and they not only destroy us now, but they set us up for eternal destruction. You see that? Jesus makes an even greater and more bizarre claim a little bit later on here in John 6 by promising that anyone who eats his flesh and drinks his blood will not die. And of course, we know that Jesus is pointing to the Lord's Supper, which he would institute later the night before he was crucified. But the point is that anyone who feeds on his words, and the words here is literally means to gnaw on them, we will live a superior life here and we will have the superior eternal life of heaven promised to us so that we can endure the horrible life that might be around us here on this earth. Look a little further there in John chapter 6, verse 47. It says, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven, and whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among them, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now we know Jesus is not talking about his physical body. We know that we, he's talking about what it is that he represents coming down from heaven, the truth. That if we consume that, we hunger for it, we thirst for it, and we consume him, we not only have a better life now, but we have the promise for eternal life. That's the superior nature of following Jesus. doesn't make us better than anyone. It just means that we're making the superior choice. In 2022, or 2012, excuse me, this clue appeared on a show of Jeopardy. Maybe you know the answer. Something special is said to be the greatest thing since this food that Chillicothe, Missouri claims to have pioneered. What is it there? What is sliced bread? You are correct. You are correct. You just won nothing, but you're correct. I will, I will buy you a, 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 a chocolate and powdered donut right after church, April, and a cup of coffee of your choosing, your flavor. Sliced bread was invented in Chillicothe, Missouri. I didn't know this, but they claim to have invented sliced bread. But no matter how you slice it, Jesus as the bread of life is the best thing for us. He is life. His words, his ideas, what he has left to us. Because we are compromised in our behavior by the sexualism of culture that leads to sexual immorality and impurity, but also in debauchery. Compromised behavior for 2,000, Alex. Many of the people you know have no idea why you would symbolically eat the body of Jesus and drink his blood as communion with him. But we must eradicate this pattern 
or we must eradicate, or educate them, excuse me, we must educate them that this pattern established by Jesus as the bread of life leads to superior living and a superior eternity because we examine ourselves so we can put aside any deeds of darkness revealed by Jesus which are part of gratifying the desires of the flesh. That's why in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, or verse 11 through 14, it says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and je jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. And that's what's going on in our present time. We have all these deeds of darkness. And Jesus says, well, let me help you put on the armor of light by consuming me as the bread of life. The opposite of the bread of life for those who behave indecently. They carouse, they drink, they're involved in sexual immorality, debauchery. and Debauchery is just this kind of if there's a word picture with it where you have someone who said, come over here, come over here, do this, do this. You know, like you got that devil that's sitting on your shoulder saying, go over here and do that. It's indecent. It's dark. Instead, we should clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ, consume him, and don't think about gratifying the desires of the flesh in a very simple way. And then we can overcome the flesh. That's how we overcome our compromised behavior is we can overcome the flesh. There's nothing else that gives us the power to do that. You know that? Jesus is the only one, his words, his messages, his principles, his patterns, his ideas are the only things that can empower us to overcome our fleshly desires, our need to gratify the flesh. And that's why he is much, so much more superior to any other offering that the world has for us. It says here, this is what you can do to kind of fix whatever you're going through. Now, make, Jesus makes an incredibly important claim here. He says to them in John 6, do not work for food that spoils. But work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. They're all, it's always these fads that come along and say, man, this is what you ought to do. This is, this is what, this is life. This is living. This, and those things pass away as the people who promoted them pass away. Just drawing innocent victims into debauchery and immorality and impurity. They're the victims. But Jesus says, I'm the one that has God's seal of approval. Only Jesus, as the bread of life, has that seal of approval from the Creator, which guarantees that we can trust Him. He will sustain us. He's a superior choice. Some of you here are old enough to remember when bread was delivered right to your home. Do you remember that? No? No, no one remembers when they, maybe just didn't know they out in the country. When you live in the country, you just get the bread out of the oven, right? It's, it's right there. If you live in the city, they, uh, back in the day, they would deliver uh, milk and bread to you, right? And we lived in the city, and when I was a young kid, uh, each morning you'd hear kind of a little uh, tink, 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 and you'd go to the door and the milkman had delivered the milk for the day and they were in these glass jugs, you'd put them in the refrigerator or the ice box as we called it back then. It wasn't really an ice box, it was a refrigerator, but people still called them ice boxes because the first refrigerators were actually ice boxes. You know, they put a big chunk of ice up in the top and they would keep things cold during the day. Does anybody remember when they had big chunks of ice delivered to them? No, okay, so... But anyway, Jesus is, uh, the idea here is that um, back in the 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, bread and milk were delivered daily by the local bakery and dairy 
especially in big cities and not in the country, obviously. And I remember one of my friends, Davey Stevens, his dad, he worked for Bunny Bread. And uh, he would bring, he'd go around, and I loved going, uh, when he would come by after uh, school, uh, he'd come pick up Davey, and I loved just to go set in that truck because it just smelled so wonderful. <laughs> this service is back in style. I think now you can even have food delivered to your house, even out here in the country, can you? So I, I know we get deliveries out where we are. Um, but they're delivering bread and milk, and just like that, we need to make sure that we are delivering the bread of life and the milk or water of life daily to those we know and love so they can choose life instead of death. And we do this as we educate them to follow the pattern of what is proper again. And this may sound too simplistic, but basically what has happened in this world is we no longer follow the pattern of Scripture which says Jesus gives us life. The pattern now is to indulge in whatever fleshly desire we have, and we think that is life. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 3 says, Follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Jesus Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. So for us as believers... Jesus is the bread of life, sustains, and we know he's the, the superior choice. And we can have him and his message and his truth and his sustenance and his power delivered to us daily through the word and through our meditation, through our prayer. But we have a responsibility to those who are around us who are starving. And maybe we need to think of a way that we can share with those that we know in our family, our friends, who are indulging in the flesh and not participating in the bread of life that Jesus is. We need to figure out a way to help them, educate them. It doesn't mean we have to be judgmental. It just means that we need to talk to them, not be afraid to talk to them about Jesus as the bread of life. You share with them this message online or talk to them about what you've heard today, what you've learned. Jesus is the bread of life that helps us overcome our compromised behaviors. He is the one who is superior. He is the one who sustains. Now, if there are people who are starving around you physically, I know you would feel compelled to try to help them if you could. I'm telling you today, there are people in your family, in your home, in your neighborhoods, people you work with, they are literally starving to death in a spiritual sense. And you have the food that can bring them life, and that is Jesus. So as we allow him to sustain us and provide for us the superior choice and health, let's share that bread with others. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful today for this opportunity to talk about Jesus as the bread of life. We are mindful and thankful that our young people can and some of our adults can be out today at Children with Trails, helping and blessing being good and having a good time there. But for those who have taken time to be here today and those who can hear this message online, I pray that you would help us to understand that Jesus is the bread of life. That there are a lot of choices that we can make here that are fleshly, sexually immoral, impure, things that include debauchery. We're enticed to do the worldly things, but if we want to be sustained truly and have that kind of superior life, the choice is Jesus as the bread of life. And I pray, Lord, whatever ways that we've been distracted, we'd give those up and just be sustained by Christ and allow him to meet our needs through the structure that he's provided in our lives, through our families, our friends, through things we eat, through things we understand, we'd be blessed in Him. And that we would be pre prepared to bless others with Him as well. So Lord, this is my prayer today for my people here. Bless them with this message. And I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. 
A lot of God's people saying. dismissed.